Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. George Lucas is known for his world-building skills and his ability to create a modern mythology. He's also known as a pioneer in the realm of visual effects through his company, Industrial Light & Magic. Others know him as a savvy businessman who wrestled over merchandising rights for his little-known Star Wars epic for a $500,000 pay cut. By the time he sold Star Wars to Disney, the franchise had made over $20 billion in merchandise. But what a lot of people don't get about George Lucas is that a lot of his success and wisdom actually comes from his deep and intimate understanding of humanity. George Lucas was always fascinated with anthropology. After films and fast cars, it was the subject of humanity that really drove him forward. One could say that he combined all three of his great passions when he created Star Wars. You have the visual effects, you have the space battles, and the great human drama that is the Skywalker saga. And if you take a close look at the lore in Star Wars, you can see so many great human cultures neatly spliced into the Star Wars galaxy. It's what gives this franchise such a rich and organic feel. And as a student of anthropology, it was only natural for George Lucas to also develop a really deep and intimate understanding of human politics. And throughout his work, we see George Lucas's political ideas and understanding shine through. While the original trilogies have a direct connection to past wars and political movements, the connections between the Empire and fascism are clear. Now with the prequel trilogies, George does something different. Instead of talking about the past, he looks towards the future and he warns audiences about the many challenges we might face as a human society. This is a warning about great chaos and suffering that could come should we as a free society let our guards down. And what makes his message even more impressive was it started to play out in 1999 with episode one, Phantom Menace. At the time, the world was full of great peace and optimism. My childhood was mostly in the 90s and it was a carefree time in our world. The year I was born, the Berlin Wall collapsed, marking the end of the Cold War. Gorbachev had made a brave step towards bringing peace to the world, and Boris Yeltsin, who followed him, seemed too drunk and jolly to return the Russian Federation to war footing. The West would rush in with economists and bureaucrats to help set up free markets in former Soviet states. It is quite rare for victors in a conflict to actually help their defeated foes. And this is what always made the West so special. It's not that the West was inherently better or had a more moral culture. If anything, the European continent was one of the most violent places in human history for several centuries. And perhaps it's because of this violent history that the West finally learned from its many past mistakes, like the overly harsh penalties that the Allied powers levied on Germany post-war World War I, which most likely led to the rise of Hitler and the start of World War II. And so the West came into the former Soviet states looking not to conquer, but to instead create economic ties and friendships so that another war would not occur on the European continent. Then you have the emergence of NATO as a peacekeeping force. They would intervene during the Bosnian War and also the Kosovo War, and it showed us that the West actually had the power to back its ideology. Political scientist Francis Fukuyama famously declared that we had reached the end of history in The Last Man. It's the title of his most famous novel and most doomed prediction. He claimed that liberal democracies had won and that the enlightened values of individual liberty, economic cooperation, human rights would spread all across the planet and we would have peace. Now, Fukuyama was wrong, just like H.G. Wells was wrong with his 1914 novel titled The War to End War, a criticism of German militarism during World War I. Now, ideologically speaking, Francis Fukuyama isn't completely wrong. Uh, liberal democracies seem to be the most efficient form of government in the world. Immigration numbers, the standard of living alone tells that tale. But democracies are precious things. They're extraordinarily difficult to build and extremely easy to dismantle. It's a system built on mutual trust, cooperation, and shared values. Fukuyama's problem was that he was naive to assume that the more wretched parts of humanity, greed and fear, would not overwhelm weakened and unstable societies across the planet. He was naive to think that the battles against evil and malicious individuals could ever end. And I guess that's easy to do when you are, in fact, living in a liberal democracy and enjoying living standards that only kings in the past could really enjoy. Before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, BetterHelp. The world is rapidly changing. We're better connected to each other as a society. We're constantly interacting with people on social media. We watch streamers and YouTubers who have a much more intimate connection with their audiences than legacy media. So then why does it all feel so empty? Well, it's because nothing can really substitute meaningful conversation and interaction. 
And sometimes when we're struggling to make sense of things, our mental health is affected. Talking to a licensed therapist can be one of the best things you can do. BetterHelp makes the entire process of finding the right therapist and setting up an appointment as streamlined as possible. You can have therapy sessions over the phone, through voice chat, or even messaging. It all depends on your level of comfort. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire that will assess your specific needs. In most cases, one of the 30,000 therapists working with BetterHelp will be matched with you within 48 hours. If you guys want to join the more than 4 million people already using BetterHelp, check out the description down below and click on the link. You guys can get 10% off of your first month of BetterHelp. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. The way the West viewed the world in the 90s is actually very similar to how the citizens of the Galactic Republic viewed the galaxy during the last age of the Republic. This is a period widely seen as a golden age. The galaxy had been at peace since the Seventh Battle of Rusan, which occurred more than a thousand years earlier. That battle marked the end of the New Sith Wars and the complete destruction of the Sith. Just like Francis Fukuyama and H.G. Wells, the people who lived in the Republic during this period believed that they were special, that somehow in their little window of history, they would break the cycle of conflict and tyranny. The Jedi also believed that their battle and struggle with the dark side was over. Even when one of their most esteemed members, Master Qui-Gon Jinn, dueled what clearly was a Sith Lord, notice the anti-employment face tattoos, no one believed him. My only conclusion can be that it was a Sith Lord. Impossible. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. I do not believe the Sith could have returned without us knowing. Human beings, even wise Jedi Masters, have short lifespans, and therefore, a short-term view of history. This is just how we were built, and the Sith had been seen in a thousand years. You might as well tell people that you fought a Velociraptor. I mean, the only person who was kind of neutral when Qui-Gon Jinn uh, said that the Sith were coming back was Yoda, and he had lived for hundreds of years. Ah, hard to see the dark side is. In a wider context, the Sith aren't just an organization of dark side force users, they represented an age of conflict and barbarity that the Republic thought it had escaped. This was supposed to be a civilized time period. The Republic had won and had driven back the Sith Empire and proved once and for all that the Republic and its democratic values, the free market had championed and spread across the known galaxy had ended the need for future conflict. I mean, the Republic was so sure of this sentiment that they actually disbanded their federal military and then spread all of those funds to the local planetary defense forces. The idea was without an enemy left to fight, the biggest threat against the Republic would be the federal military and it being used against the populace. It was a noble and inspired idea, but perhaps a little bit too extreme. And it completely doesn't take into account human, you know, sentient being nature. Now, on the other end of the philosophical spectrum from individuals like Fukuyama are those who believe that human beings in their very nature are greedy, selfish, and prone to violence. You have the Steve Bannons of the world who await some great clash of civilizations and the destruction of the world. You have brilliantly pessimistic and slightly insane writers like Nietzsche. The truth is there's no right or wrong answer when you're discussing the state of humanity and what course will take into the future. I mean, both schools of thought are relevant here. Humanity can definitely enlighten itself to a state of peace and success. I mean, compared to the rest of the human history, the world today is safer, kinder, richer than ever before. In the West, the poorest among us still have access to healthcare and nutrition that not even kings had in the past. It's clear also that in the last few centuries, with each step backwards, we're taking two steps forwards and we're learning a lot of times from our mistakes. Well, not all of our mistakes, but a lot of the mistakes that we've made. It's also clear that there will always be individuals who will try to bring us back into chaos. No society is immune to anarchy and tyranny. These are not two sides of a coin. They are siblings in their extreme and fatalistic views of the world. Even the Galactic Republic, with all its wealth and stability, couldn't avoid the trappings that many Western democracies face today. The Republic, since its earliest days, was founded on two basic principles. One was sentient rights. The founders of the Republic were slaves. They had just thrown off the yokes of oppression uh, years before they established the Republic. And two, most of the people who founded the Republic were human and had this entrepreneurial spirit, which really helped the Republic grow at a rapid pace. And this was thanks to free market economics. In a lot of ways, the Republic is an analog for the liberal democracy worldview of today. But here's the thing, just because your system is founded on lofty principles and you have the high ground, morally speaking, doesn't mean you can just float on those laurels. Creating an egalitarian society in which everyone is prosperous and happy is a never-ending struggle. And the leaders of the Republic during the Golden Age made the mistake of believing that their founding document would somehow provide a shield over their more nefarious actions and inadequacies. The roots of the Clone Wars are extremely 
abundantly clear from a historical standpoint. After centuries of neglect, the Outer Rim territories looked for an alternative to Republic rule. Yes, Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis before him had a hand in exasperating tensions between the Outer Rim colonies and the core regions of the galaxy, but as much as we'd like to think that a few shadowy individuals from behind the scenes can affect world events, in reality, the power has always been in the people's hand. The masses are who move the world, not shadowy individuals. Take the color revolutions that swept over Georgia in 2003, Ukraine in 2004, and later Ukraine again in 2014. These pro-democracy movements on the border of the Russian Federation created a great deal of paranoia for the Kremlin. Putin has always claimed that these demonstrations were just full of actors that were paid by the CIA in America. As if calls for a free society, individual rights, and a more transparent political system are only values that people in the West can enjoy, and not universal values that a lot of people want. And let me tell you something. Yes, America, the CIA, is involved in a lot of countries, as is the Kremlin, as is the uh, CCP. But as we found out in Afghanistan, it doesn't matter how much money you pump into a country, if the people in that country don't want change, if they don't want democracy, then there will be no democracy. Of course, how could a dictator like Putin, who cares very little for his own people, understand the people of another nation? How can a dictator who uses his own people as cannon fodder understand the political will of the people? This is Putin's blind spot, and the blind spot of most authoritarian leaders. They disrespect the individual, see them as inconsequential, they see them as puny, and they will suffer in the long run for disregarding what their needs are. Take a look at Palpatine. Yeah, the entire galaxy in his hands with the collapse of the Republic. But instead of working on how he could truly make the galaxy a better place for the average citizen, he oppressed them, squeezed every little bit of labor and dignity from them until the entire galaxy rose up against him and threw him down. Now back to the Galactic Republic. They always had this blind spot because of their founding charter. They believed themselves to be morally superior because they did champion a democratic system. The reality was the grievances of the Outer Rim planets were real. The Outer Rim territories lacked the population and therefore capital to develop infrastructure to maintain growth. And without that growth, there was no ability for the Outer Rim territories to fund their own defense. The demilitarization of the Republic worked for core world's planets that could fund their own massive defense forces, but most colonies in the Outer Rim barely had enough credits to secure their own food supplies, let alone pay for a navy. And so you had worlds that were perpetually under the onslaught of bandits and pirates, but at the same time, these colonies were beholden to Republic regulations, laws, and at times even tariffs and taxes. This was a classic case of no taxation without representation, which of course leads to don't tread on me, and yeah, it was justified. The Outer Rim territories were fed up with the core regions. Ultimately, the free trade zone was set up by the Republic Senate as a last ditch effort to figure out some way to stabilize the area. But it was really a lazy policy. I mean, pass on the responsibility of the federal government to develop new territories to corporate entities, and the outcomes, of course, were obvious. In place of local government, now you had essentially corporate feudalism and whatever short-term growth and stability that these corporate entities brought were quickly replaced by just really oppressive measures. You had price fixing, you had indentured servitude, all the worst stuff. This is an important lesson for the elites in our own economic and political system. While I'm a staunch defender of capitalism, for the same reasons I'm a staunch defender of democracy, because it is a terrible economic system, but it is better than literally every other economic system we've ever tried. But still, if we continue to ignore the growing income inequality, the monopolization of entire industries by a handful of companies, the predatory nature of not only Wall Street, but now these new money, digital age, crypto scammers and gurus, the whole system will collapse. And that's because this entire capitalistic system, the free market, it, it all depends on the consumer, the individual that I guess a lot of people at the top see as being on the bottom, but they really are on the bottom because they are the foundation of the entire economic system. It doesn't really matter how much wealth you can accumulate as an individual if the average person no longer buys into the system, is unwilling to work ungodly hours just to survive. Everyone goes down together. A galaxy-wide war seemed improbable to the elites living in their high towers in Coruscant on the eve of the Clone Wars. After all, who would fight this war? Martial cultures had disappeared from the galaxy. There weren't that many professional soldiers left anymore. Surely the citizens of the Republic wouldn't fight in a war. Could you imagine the Corps Ward citizens being drafted and forced into the trenches? <laughs> the Outer Rim, I can't imagine. You know, I was almost drafted. Imagine me serving. 
Now, Papadino understood the public sentiment at the time and the unwillingness of the average individual in the Republic to fight a war. And so instead he created a clone army in secret and gave the Separatist Alliance an army of droids. This was a masterful move. It's probably his best move because by removing the constituents, the voters from the battlefield, he was able to make a political justification for a ton of violence. Sustaining a war becomes politically much easier if the people voting are not actually suffering. And of course, just because the clones were fighting droids didn't mean that billions upon billions of lives would eventually be lost due to collateral damage. But of course, that would come much later, and by that time, the war was already spiraling out of control. This is a lesson that becomes increasingly relevant in today's day and age. Now that every nation on Earth is racing to perfect remote piloted combat systems and even completely automated combat systems for the future, we're heading towards a future where politicians can declare war with relatively little impunity. And so in today's world, it's important that we stay vigilant, aware that the peace we live in and enjoy comes at a great price. We need to remember that there are still evil and barbaric forces out there that are seeking to dismantle all the progress we've achieved so far. Had the Ukrainians simply folded and collapsed, allowing the Russian Federation to spill over the border, what would have happened next? Would Poland have gotten involved or maybe some of the NATO nations in the Baltics would Moldova fall next? If the United States and the European Union did not hand over its military stockpiles and surplus to help the Ukrainians hold back the Russian onslaught, would China have seen this weakness in the Western powers as an excuse to invade Taiwan? History is full of Neville Chamberlains and Winston Churchills. Neither individual is good or evil at their core, but one was at the right place in the right time and preserved Western civilization, and the other was the wrong person at the wrong time and almost threw it all away. It's always been like this all throughout history razor thin margins, a few good men stepping up at the right time in the right moment and saving us all. And so it's important for us to be vigilant, to be aware of the many malicious powers out there, but also stay optimistic about the future of humanity. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is definitely a worthy cause to partake in. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.